Hi, from the Simplicity Project. Welcome to our estrogen dominant seminar. So I'm surrounded here by an incredible group of women who are going to remain a mystery to you. You will not see them, but you will hear their voices because these seminars are meant to be very informative. And for them to be informative, we have to ask lots of questions. Um, so with this, you're going to get handouts. So you're going to have a lot of literature to take away. We're going to go for about 75 to 90 minutes, and uh, I hope love every single moment of it because this is going to parlay us into our book club that launches in September where we take all 10 chapters of the Simplicity Project and we peel back the layers month by month, chapter by chapter so that by those end or the end of those 10 months you have a solid understanding of exactly what's happening in this body. So for tonight the subject is estrogen dominance and we're going to get going. So welcome everybody. So you've got your handouts down in front of you here. Um, estrogen dominance, how many of you have ever heard of this before? Okay, so pretty much everyone. Has it only been in the last, like, year that you've heard about it? Longer just than recently, that? Just in my magazine that I was reading. Okay. I was talking about a little bit about it. All right, okay. So how many of you in here um, have had any history with any hormonal issues that are going on? Okay, so it could be anything from having a fibroid, having a cyst, having polycystic ovarian syndrome, and cyst and PCOS are not the same thing, and we'll talk about the difference of that. Having insulin resistance, having weight gain, having difficulty with your energy levels, having painful menstrual cycles, having exacerbated PMS, having chronic headaches, having digestive upset. Has anybody had any of those issues? So everyone has had some level of estrogen dominance. And that is the whole thing about this, is that we hear the keyword estrogen, and we think, okay, so that means that I have to be producing way too much estrogen, and then not enough progesterone, and not enough testosterone, or DHEA, or any of the other hormones that are involved. And with estrogen dominance, that's really not the case. There's two ways that our body has extra estrogen in our system. The first is by the ovaries in the body actually producing that estrogen. The second is the way that we're getting it in through the products of our environment. So that is coming in from everything in terms of drinking out of plastic bottles. And this is a hard habit for people to break because it's convenient, right? You go and you buy the case of plastic bottles, it's done, it's effortless, you carry it out with you. The problem being is that the plastic, the chemicals that are in the plastic are leaching into the water that you are consuming. And this is loaded with something called xenoestrogens. So xeno means foreign estrogen. And the problem with these chemical forms and these foreign estrogens is that every single cell in your body requires a key to be able to open that cell and unlock it and either make it flourish and create a totally vital system or to start to denature it and affect it in a negative way, leading to things like cancer and genetic um, uh, deformation and autoimmune disorders. So what happens with these xenoestrogens is that the estrogen is so closely linked to the estrogen your own body is producing, your body sees it coming in and says, well, I know you, you're estrogen, I've, I've met you before, absolutely you can come in, and unlocks and the cell opens up and now this form of estrogen gets into your body and it is not the safe, healthy form of estrogen. So it starts to now, it, you've planted the seed and it has the opportunity to now grow and to flourish. There are many types of estrogen dominant cancers that are out now where they can actually see the results of taking these chemical forms of estrogen and putting them in petri dishes with tumors and the tumors will grow. They metastasize. So that right there is motivation enough to get rid of something like the plastic water bottles. But it doesn't just end there. As women, we are targeted more so than any other uh, group because we use the majority of these products, cosmetics, so your makeup, your shampoo, your conditioner, your lotions, your potions, whatever it is that you're putting on your skin. And why that is such an important thing to start to shift away from is that your largest organ in your entire body is your skin. And it is eating all day long. So where we start to think about digestion, we think about the digestion that's happening in the gut, which is essentially the foundation of our health and our vitality, your skin that's digesting doesn't have a stomach. It doesn't have to go through the steps and the procedures of that. It's called transdermal. It's bioavailable. Whatever you put on the skin, your skin's open. It's porous. It pulls it right down into it. Now it's right into your bloodstream. And it works its way into your lymphatic system. 
So um, by the end of this seminar tonight, you're going to probably feel overwhelmed. I'm going to be honest with you about that because it's going to be a lot of information. And for a lot of you, it's going to be a big shift from what you are used to doing. Because I mean, when you talk about skincare products, the typical thing is we have a shower. We're usually having a warmer shower. So we're vasodilating, we're opening up the pores on the skin. And then we're using those products in the shower and then we get out of the shower and then we're slathering more of it on our open pores on our skin. And you can just start to see how it happens, you know, innocently. And it's with good intention. We think we're doing something good for our body. You know, the product smells good. It suds, it bubbles. It feels nice when it goes on. But when we start to actually look a little deeper into it, the impact and the effect of, you know, things that seem simple like that over time have a really negative effect on the way that our hormones are working, these hormone disruptors. So what happens in estrogen dominance is it's not that your body is producing more estrogen in terms of estradiol, okay, which is your healthy form of the estrogen. It's the chemical forms of estrogen that are coming in. When you, for instance, look at women who are perimenopausal, or menopausal. When you're into those stages of life, and perimenopause can happen anywhere from 8 to 10, even 12 years before true menopause has its onset. We should be seeing that there is a significant decrease in the estrogen in the body because the ovaries are starting to produce less and less because you're moving farther away from your childbearing years. It's the cycle of life. It's just it's what happens in our bodies, and so it should. The problem now that we're seeing is that women who are perimenopausal, menopausal, even postmenopausal, Part of their body is trying desperately to get through this phase and to work its way out of this reproductive life cycle in its body. And here's this other huge messenger that is keeping the estrogen pumping up while everything else in the body is starting to wane down. And this excess estrogen will start to eat up and utilize the progesterone in your system. And progesterone is what gives us healthy skin. It's what helps to keep hot flashes at bay. It's what helps to reduce the incidence of insomnia. So when this estrogen level is up, we have the hot flashes for a longer period of time, the issues with our sleep increases, we start to gain weight around our waist, insulin resistance starts to become an issue. So I'm giving you a broad overview in the beginning, and, and as we start to go through, we'll get deeper and deeper into it. But you can already feel within about seven, eight minutes of hearing it, that it's a pretty big topic. It should be being discussed often. Um, I would love to start to see, and it probably won't happen in the Western medicine world, but that when you go for your yearly physical, you're given a checklist. And it's broken up into the components, very similar to what's in the Simplicity Project and Dr. Natasha Turner's Hormone Diet, where you actually go through and you do this for yourself once or twice a year. If you're dealing with an estrogen dominant condition, maybe you're doing it once a quarter, once every season. And you're going through and looking at how is my thyroid doing? How are my levels of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone? How is my serotonin doing, my melatonin, my DHEA, right? All of these different areas of our body so we can have a better picture from you know, season to season in terms of making sense of, maybe that's why I'm feeling this way. So much of it gets concocted and we feel like it's just in our head or maybe we're overacting about it. You have no greater picture of symptomatology in your body than the person staring back at you in the mirror. And that is the truth. We are born with this incredible intuition and ability to really have a great conversation with our bodies. And over the years, we get told a different thing or we start taking medication and we start taking antibiotics for things or we start to possibly over vaccinate or we start to do a lot of topical creams and what that does is it just suppresses those messages deeper and deeper into the body and then we hear a story right we get told a certain story if you think about back in sex education in school if we even had that it was okay when you're such and such an age you're going to have a menstrual period this is what it is you know you lead for x amount of days and that and one day you're going to have sex and as soon as you have sex you are going to get pregnant you need to make sure you have birth control and that is pretty much the extent of what sex education was at least for what i remember back in high school but as you get older and then you get to the point to the stage where you want to start a family or you're starting to have a lot of issues with your menstrual cycle and you really want to know what's going on in your body, if you were one of the women that at the age of 15 or 16 started to go on the birth control pill, you just suppress a massive, massive messenger in your system by chemically telling your body when to menstruate and when not to menstruate. 
right? And the whole issue with the birth control pill is that it is scientifically designed to convince your body that you are, in fact, pregnant. That's, that's what it does. You either go off the pill for X amount of days or you take placebo sugar pills to then allow the mind to shed. But it's not happening from a natural state in your system. What happens when you end up coming off the birth control pill, and maybe even before then, you'll end up having breakthrough bleeding. Uh, a lot of women find that they feel like they're losing their mind. They are just like essentially a bitch on wheels. And they are, feel like they are crazy. They're crying at the drop of everything. And I've had, I can't even tell you how many women in their 20s is primarily the group where I've had it happen, or women in their 40s that get put back on the birth control pill because they are having midway bleeding and issues with their menstrual cycle. And we'll talk about that deeper too. So it puts us in this kind of, um, you know, interesting position because as moms, and I'm a mother and I have a daughter, and I think to myself, well, when she gets to that age, what am I going to do? Because when I was growing up, you went on the birth control pill. That, that's what you did. And it wasn't an issue of when, okay, you want to get pregnant, you need to come off. And I remember being told, when you want to get pregnant, you come off, you wait three months, and you'll get pregnant. That, that was pretty much the story. And, I mean, I have a close group of girlfriends, ten of us from high school, and there are four out of the ten who have been struggling massively with fertility issues. IUIs, IVFs, miscarriages. That's four out of ten. That's a huge amount. And the, the rate and the increase of infertility and fertility issues has just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is definitely a hormonal connection to that. And there is definitely a mental emotional connection to that. And there is definitely an environmental. When I use the term environmental, I, I am including things like the birth control pill and different medications and things like that. Um, so what do we do? We start to learn about our menstrual cycles. That is what we do. And even all of us sitting here now, even those of you who maybe are carrying menopause or maybe have gone through menopause and you're not menstruating anymore, maybe you don't even have your ovaries and you've had a hysterectomy, you still need to understand the natural ebb and flow of your system. There is an incredible book that I think should be a tool for every young girl to start to read and understand, and it's called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Write this one down. It's by Tony Weichler. This, to me, should be, you know, a young girls and young woman, or if you've never read it, just your Bible next to the bed. It is going to blow your mind in terms of what you always should have known about your menstrual cycle. It's going to give you the ability to understand, are you actually ovulating? Do you have something called anovulation, which you can appear to have a totally normal cycle, but you actually never release an egg. You don't actually ovulate. Do you know the signs and symptoms in your body to know when you're ovulating? Do you know that when you ovulate, that you don't, there's not like 12 days a month where you can get pregnant, and there's not 24 hours where you can get pregnant. There is literally between like a three to six day span where you have the ability to get pregnant. Being able to understand that your body temperature is indicative of your menstrual cycle as well too. So this is why the thyroid is so huge, because your thyroid is your body's internal thermostat. If your thyroid is out of whack, your fertility is definitely going to be out of whack. Our modern day way of testing for our thyroid it is not accurate. The gauges and the benchmarks that medical doctors are looking for are too high. In the holistic industry, we're looking at suboptimal numbers, meaning that we want to catch the thyroid and the estrogen dominance and the insulin resistance and any of these issues when they are starting to show a level of instability. Not when they get to a point where you have full blown symptoms. Because at that point, then we are most likely looking at medication. And the problem with thyroid medication is that once you start taking it, I, I've yet to see anybody that ever comes off of it. I have worked with numerous, probably now in the hundreds, um, with women and been able to get their levels down to the minimum that they need to stay on. Right? Um, using Synthroid is, is probably the biggest one that I've worked with with women. Um, and it's by, you know, looking at the lifestyle, changing up some things, understanding more about your cycles and what's going on in the body, reducing some of the external factors and things that we're bringing into our body that are creating and hosting this estrogen dominance, making sure your digestive system is like a rock star on the inside of your body. That truly is the foundation of everything else. I can remember um, in 2000, which is when I started on this journey and really got hooked on understanding more about the hormones. 
One of my instructors, uh, who's still a mentor of mine, uh, Lorraine Soro, I went to a workshop with her, and it was about estrogen dominance. And it was the first time I had heard about it. So that's, you know, almost 14 years ago now. And I remember going to this workshop, and all of the women in the workshop kept firing out these questions. But, but this is the cause of it, and this is the cause of it. And her response to everyone's question of, is this the cause, is this the cause, was go back to your gut, go back to your gut, go back to your gut, go back to your gut. And I was just like, I don't understand. Why do you keep telling us to focus on our digestion? And she said, because without digestion, there, there is nothing else. It's the barometer of your health. If you can't actually break down the food you are consuming, if you can't actually assimilate and absorb the supplements you are taking, if you can't actually eliminate the waste of the food that is coming into your body, it doesn't matter what you do up here. It has to start down here. And there has to be a solid exit plan. Right? We have to be regular as well, because we are the sum accumulation of what we consume and what we don't poop out, essentially is what it comes down to. And you know, I can remember when I had my children and going to the family doctor, my daughter hadn't gone to the bathroom for about three or four days. And uh, you know, she was my first, and so going against my better judgment of, of knowing what I knew, I went to the doctor and I said, she hasn't had a bowel movement in three or four days. He said, that's normal, they can go nine days as infants. And I thought, what? That's not normal for an animal, let alone a baby. Like, that just doesn't make sense to me. They're eating how many times, where is it going? Like, she's not that big. You know, she's like, where is it going? It's not evaporating. So right then and there, I was just like, oh my gosh. That, and at that point there, um, and this is totally offside, but I started making my own homemade formula. Um, for, and I just started to switch, like, everything that I was doing. There was a couple of things that happened around that time. And I just thought, okay, now how many adults are being told that having only two or three bowel movements a week is okay? Because I work with people who come to me and tell me, in a good week, I might go once every three to five days. And I'm like, and do you suffer from headaches? Oh, I have the worst headaches. They're pressure headaches. And I'm like, they're poo pressure headaches. <laughs> <laughs> Barometric pressure's got nothing to do with those headaches. Right? You're, you're toxic. So you think about it, like our intestinal system, and, and why I'm going to go deeper into your digestive system is, again, because this is going to impact your hormones. If you can't fully break down and synthesize your food, your carbs, your fat, the metabolic system is linked to your endocrine system as well. So, you know, you've got like 27, 23 to 27 feet of intestinal tract that is running through your body. That's your small intestine, right, is, is that long. I think it's about 28 feet, and your large intestine is actually only about 5 feet long. It's interesting that they're called what they are. But you actually have to push poo up, and then across, and then down. Right? So it goes up the ascending pole, and goes across, and then it drops down. So even the ways that we are encouraging uh, our bodies to have a bowel movement is totally incongruent with how we should be, right? Toilet seats are getting higher as we are getting older, and so it actually continues to put your hip and bum line above your knees. Well, that means you're actually lengthening the intestinal tract, but in fact, you want to be kind of squishing it. You want to help to push. You want to help peristalsis. It's like a workout for the insides. So we actually need to have the bum lower. You go into a lot of different countries, I remember I lived in Japan and I went into my first public bathroom there and there was just a hole in the ground with rails and I was like, I was 17 and I was like, what is that? <laughs> no one told me about this. <laughs> then I went into the next stall and the next stall and they were all the same. And at the time I didn't appreciate how awesome that was. So now in North America, you can't, you know, you're not going to find a builder to do that. So you have to go and buy a stool. You put your feet on a stool so your knees come closer to your chest. And this is for children as well, too, you need this. Their poor little legs have no feeling. Like they're going numb because they're hanging up off the ground. And you wonder why they get constipation issues. So bring the blocks underneath the feet, little stool even, okay? So you can just go to the dollar store and get that, and that's going to help the body. So digestion is key, and we'll do a whole workshop on the, the, you know, the nitty-gritty of your digestive system. But that's the first thing I want you to look at as a sign and symptom in your own body. Journaling is going to be one of the most powerful tools that you can use and create for yourself. I think keeping a book next to your nightstand um, is, is pretty awesome. So instead of watching TV at night before you go to bed or you know updating on your phone, which I can be guilty as charged for that, uh, writing down in your journal, kind of just a glance of the day. What you ate, how you felt, um, did you have a bowel movement, those types of things are going to give you some real insight. And you're going to start to notice patterns. 
So, you know, the days you didn't go to the bathroom, you were more tired, you were more sluggish, you felt like you needed to unbutton your pants at work throughout the day, uh, your sleep wasn't that great that night, you had the headache, um, maybe you had worse breath that day, you had that kind of taste in the mouth, you were more thirsty than usual. All those little things, really their message, they're telling us something more that's going on in the body. So um, if you look down, we've gone through about what's causing your estrogen dominance. Um, how do these xenoestrogens affect you, these chemical forms affect you? And this is just some of the different conditions that can be happening in your body. So PMS, um, you know, I was talking with a woman the other day and it was interesting because, um, you know, again, it's this whole thing, we just kind of move through our body and saying, you know, I realized I forgot even that PMS is like, pre-menstrual syndrome. I'm thinking like it gives me an excuse to be cranky on my cycle. But PMS is actually before and that's it. So recognizing in yourself, if you have really severe PMS, like where you and everyone else around you knows when your cycle is, no one else should know when you're getting your period, okay? <laughs> if it is like common knowledge because of your behavior, that is a pretty good indication you have got out of whack hormones, right? We need to get them back into balance. So this will be things, it'll be your mood, your sleep will be off. You might notice digestively that you're off. You might get swelling and discomfort. If you have a lot of swelling and discomfort in and around the ovaries, if it's referring into your low back spine as well too, um, there is a big difference between having tenderness and a feeling of pressure and swelling versus having menstrual cramps. Menstrual cramps will be more centralized and they'll be local into the belly. And that can just be from some of the uterine contraction that's happening. And that's helping the body to get ready to shed the uterine lining. That is what your menstrual cycle is. When you have uh, pressure and discomfort that's moving bilaterally in between the hip bones and around the ovaries and it's moving into the back, this is where I would be taking a deeper look at your insulin levels and also a possibility of estrogen dominance because that to me tells me that the ovaries are under some, some stress. Um, the other thing too is that if your cravings just go insane, okay? Now, there is a difference here. I know a lot of people um, and some of my friends who just use that as an excuse to be like, you know, I needed to buy a family size chocolate bar because my cravings were just out of control. First thing is to understand about stuff with chocolate is that if you love dark chocolate, you actually like chocolate. If you love milk chocolate and like Halloween is your time of the year, you actually just like sugar. You don't really like chocolate. Because if we take the sugar out of the chocolate, you won't eat that. So it's not chocolate you like, it's sugar. Okay, so that is another indication too. If you have crazy salt cravings, right? Big thing with estrogen dominance, your magnesium is severely diminished. So this is another part of the whole sleep issue. Uh, if you can't fall asleep well, or you get to sleep and then you wake up and you can't get back to sleep. If you find you have muscle twitches, your calves are cramping, you have restless leg syndrome, in excess estrogen will zap all of that magnesium. It'll suck it right up. Same thing with zinc and a lot of the, the trace minerals, the antioxidants in your body. Um, your B vitamins will be gone like that because your B vitamins are what are supporting your entire nervous system. And they are literally what is massaging your adrenals, which are like your body's SWAT team in response to stress that you are dealing with. Um, so taking a look at a different supplement uh, protocol for your body as well to eating foods that are rich in magnesium, keeping your body hydrated, that is huge. Dehydration sets in. So notice how you're feeling before your cycle. Um, I also work with a lot of women who are perimenopausal, meaning that they are, at this point now, they're not getting a cycle all the time. Or what happens is their cycles are getting closer together. So instead of having like a 26 to 35 day cycle, they're now having like a 21 day cycle, or maybe like every two weeks they're bleeding. And it may not be a full period, but they're having bits of spotting. Um, and, and this is the classic scenario when this happens with women, is that things start to shift menstrually. And you go to the family doctor and say, look, I don't know what's going on, something's wrong with my hormones, I'm having breakthrough bleeding now, or I'm bleeding like a ridiculous amount, I am soaking through a pad in literally like an hour, and I'll have a tampon. It, it's crazy, my energy level is down. You can tell your iron level is low because to get up and do anything just feels like it is so much work for you. And the first thing that your family doctor will do is say, uh, okay, let's run some blood work and see where things are at. And then the next course of action will be, let's put you on the birth control pill. 
The birth control pill will help you, it'll tell your body, it'll start to regulate those hormones for you, you're gonna feel so much better. So you go on the birth control pill. Nothing gets better because the birth control pill perpetuates the estrogen dominance because it's more chemical forms of estrogen coming into your body. Now the catch-22 with the birth control pill is not only is it elevating the estrogen even higher, and the first month or so you might feel like, oh my gosh, this is a saving grace, I feel better. And then you're gonna, it's going to start to decline and it's going to decline fast because the pill is going to rob you of more magnesium, more B vitamins, more progesterone. It's going to suck the life out of your DHA, which is your youth hormone that the body is producing. Um, and then you'll go back to your family doctor and say, the pill is not working. I'm still having a breakthrough bleeder. I'm not feeling good. And they'll say, okay, let's set you up with a gynecologist. <laughs> a gynecologist and uh, talk about doing a cervical ablation. Well, they will go in and cauterize and literally burn the lining of the uterus uh, because what they will believe is that the uterine lining is thickened, meaning that it, it, you know, it's thick and that's what's causing all the pain and the discomfort. These are like precursor signs to also endometriosis. And endometriosis is a 100% estrogen dominant situation. Estrogen dominance is what brought the endometriosis on. It's not the other way around. So you go and you have the cervical ablation. And I have worked with women who have had two, three, and four cervical ablations over the course of X amount of years. I had one woman I remember working with and she bled for six months straight every single day. Her ferritin levels were down to nine. Then she was going for blood transfusions and they were not getting picked back up. Um, I ended up actually sending her, I did work with her food-wise, and she started to get a bit better, and then I sent her to a homeopath, a friend of mine, who started using remedies for her, within three days she stopped bleeding. And I still stay in touch with her now, and her cycle has re-regulated itself through some of the lifestyle stuff that we did. We took out a lot of the chemical things that she had into her body. Uh, she also drank about six diet coke a day. That was a huge one as well, too. Because um, also, not me, the diet part of it being aspartame is a whole another situation, but the pop, the carbonation, all the phosphorus is leaching all the minerals from your body. The minerals, your trace minerals, it's what helps to keep your blood sugar stable. It's what helps to keep you here. All the carbonation is like setting off a bomb in your digestive system as well. So it, you're acidifying the body and creating more inflammation. Um, and for you know every cup of coffee, every cup of, of pop, every cup of sugary juice that you have, you actually need to have an extra cup of water on top of the baseline of what your recommended fluid intake is. So it doesn't count towards it. Uh, and that can be a big shift for people too because I work with some people where their whole morning it's just coffee. That is their food. Um, and, and that can be a big one to get your body off of. Um, so PMS is one of them, endometriosis, irregular periods, anovulation that we talked about, the heavy bleeding. Uh, and this is a hard one too because if you were a young woman that started off with irregular menstrual cycles and you get told a story, your mother had it, her mother had it, your aunt had it, your, your cousin had it, this is just you. That you this, is, this is just what you inherited. It's bullshit. It, it, honestly, it is. If you choose to believe it and live with it, you can choose to stop it and draw a line in the sand and say, not happening, I am not going to be how everyone else is, and I'm not just going to sit back and settle for that. You can 100% take a hold of that and make that shift in your body. So, you know, it, it's listening to that part too. Don't believe the story, change it, rewrite it for yourself. Just start to take some different steps in the right direction. Um, and uh, fibroids and cysts and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So three totally different things that end up getting lumped into one. So when you have fibroids, okay, fibroids are fibrous tissue that are actually in the uterus, okay? So they are painful, the cysts are painful too, but fibroids are happening for a different reason than the cysts are happening in the PCOS. Now, I work with a lot of people who think that when they have cysts, it means that they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. It does not. If you have a cyst or you have had situations where you're getting one cyst at a time spread apart, because cyst, you can get a cyst and it can you know, be a bad one, it can be there for a while and then it can shrink back down and then years can go by and you don't have one and then it'll creep itself back in there. Remember too that stress is a huge dominating factor. So maybe you have this ovarian cyst 
for a period of time and then you started to make some shifts and maybe things in life just kind of calmed down a bit and before you got pregnant, pregnancy actually puts those cysts into remission because your levels of progesterone and all of those incredible hormones, your body is just flooded with them. So, you know, a lot of issues, even things like MS goes into um, suppression when you are pregnant. Um, so you might get pregnant, have a child, and then a few years later, you're stressed out, or something happens again, or you start to adopt those little lifestyles and the cyst creeps up again. Now, you can have, there's all different severity of cysts. I have worked with women before whose cysts have literally ruptured and they have nearly died. They have been uh, filled with blood up to their lungs. Um, and it has been horrible and they've had to go in and have the ovary removed. I have a friend of mine who just had a huge mass removed. Um, they caught ovarian cancer early, which you can't screen for ovarian cancer. Um, you don't take a vaccine to prevent against ovarian and cervical cancer either. You just live a healthy lifestyle and you stay in tune with your body and its messages. When you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, you have multiple cysts happening at a time. So if you look, has everybody seen a picture of your ovaries before to see what they look like? They actually kind of look like a lotus, right? If you look at it that way at the ends of the fallopian tubes. So when you have a cyst, you'll see one enlarged lump or cyst that's on the ovary. A polycystic um, ovary, it is like a bunch of grapes. It's all lumpy and there is multiple cysts that are happening. With PCOS, PCOS is the most severe out of the fibroids and of the cysts. Your PCOS is the most severe. And with PCOS, insulin resistance is 100% there, which is also known as syndrome X. So insulin resistance means that over the years, your body's ability, your beta cells and your body on a cellular level, no longer has the ability to uptake the insulin that is coming into your system or the glucose that is coming into your system for the pancreas then to be able to regulate your insulin and keep your blood sugar level stable and balanced, keeping your energy stable and balanced, keeping your mood. So when the body doesn't have the ability to uptake any more of this glucose into the cells and it stays into your body, your blood sugar skyrockets and then what goes up must come down. And along with this elevation of the blood sugar and the insulin and the dropping, your cravings become crazy and the cravings you want it is for sugary, starchy, carby things. So it's not just going to be going for a chocolate bar. You're going to want more bread. You're going to want more pasta. You're going to want the cereals. You're not going to feel satisfied. A meal is not going to feel like a meal to you unless you've had a potato with it or rice with it or bread with it. Um, you know, and some of that is also part of the story we grew up with, that that is just how you build a meal. Like you have to have that that that's, you know, that's not a meal. But your body is fundamentally craving it from a different place when you have insulin resistance. And the problem is, is that when you start to take too much of this food, number one, it's just like opening up Pandora's box. You just want more. You can't get enough of it. You eat it, and then you are exhausted. You want to have a nap after. This is also how you know you have insulin resistance. Your food no longer gives you energy. It actually starts to suck the life out of you. And you feel like you need to now lay down in order to process what you've had. Or you're at work and you have a really you know, carby based lunch, or you have a sugary quick morning snack, and you start to feel your energy going, and you're falling asleep as you're sitting up, and you're, oh my gosh, I need to go get another coffee, or I need, to I need to have something stimulating, just something, just for today. I just need to have that thing that's gonna pick me up. Then today rolls into tomorrow, and the cycle repeats itself, because you haven't drawn the line. You haven't stopped the actions that are creating that same response over and over again in your system. You had a question? Yes, yeah, so how does syndrome X compare to type 2 diabetes? Insulin resistance will precurse type 2 diabetes. If you have type 2 diabetes, you have insulin resistance for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, so um, with type 2 diabetes, which is, uh, it's, it was called adult onset. It's no longer called adult onset anymore. It's lifestyle onset diabetes now um, because there's children as young as 2 years old that are being diagnosed with type 2, not type 1 diabetes. And this is purely coming from what we are ingesting. At that age, it's what you're ingesting, because two-year-olds are they're active, right? So it's what is going into uh, into their bodies. Um, so that that is a big one. And with PCOS, it would be a different dietary approach than I would even have, um, you know, somebody who has other uh, estrogen dominant situations going on. It'd be a very strict protocol with PCOS because we want to kind of shock the body in a way where we deprive it of the thing it craves and wants the most. 
Um, and I don't believe in putting people on diets where it's like you have the, you know, one piece of celery with like, you know, a tablespoon of peanut butter and raisins on it and it's ants on a log and that's what you, you know, <laughs> have for a snack. That's cool when you're four. When you're 44 and you're looking forward to your snack and you don't have, that's not cool anymore, right? That's like somewhat of punishment. So I really firmly believe in, you know, using whole foods and whole foods, what is that? It's your food, how it is falling from the trees, growing from the ground. It is food as it is made in its natural state, not where we have taken it from its natural state then put it into a lab. We then hire scientists to mix it all around and make it fluffier and make it brighter and make it last for years on a shelf, package it, make it look beautiful and then pass it off to you and say, bon appetit, right? That's another way that we are creating this, you know, internal mess in our system and in our body. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, how do you differentiate between just with irregularity of periods? Yes. Whether or not that's estrogen dominance, or could it possibly be part of the natural change when you're perimenopausal? So, for example, I'm 49. Yes. So sometimes I'll go a long time between periods, and then sometimes my periods are bunched together. You would look. So how do I know? So how you would? It's a really good question. That would not be your only symptom. So if all that's changing in your body, the bigger messenger is the fact that the cycles are shifting, which will naturally happen with perimenopause. What I would recommend doing is tracking it. it for those of you, um, I don't know if uh, BlackBerry has this, but on iPhones there's an incredible uh, app called Period Tracker, and it's awesome. So you go onto your period tracker. Um, There's one for Amazon called Fertility Friend. Fertility Friend, that's a good name too. So you're, and it's great too because if you, depending on how techy you are, you can download it to your other computer and you can see it on a bigger screen. But um, it gives you, uh, it'll give you your whole month ahead. And so when you start doing this, you'll punch in when you have your menstrual cycle. And then it will um, predict when your next cycle is going to come. It'll graph it and it'll log it for you. You can enter it in here too. Um, if you go back and add notes, it has all these different symptoms that you can plug in. You can put in your mood, your exercise, your weight, your temperature. It'll graph it all for you. You put in when um, you have had um, sex as well too, so it'll tell you over a course of months when you're doing this, A, if you're starting to see, like normally what happens with perimenopause is that you'll get a cycle and then it won't happen for a couple months then you get it. And then it won't be a couple months when you get it. So there still is a regular cycle that's happening within the irregularity. And then what happens is the cycles just either start to become farther apart or when the cycles happen, they become lighter themselves. And then it just, like full menopause, you have to do menses for a year, a calendar year. Um, this is a great tool for, you know, we were talking about not going on the birth control pill. If you can start to understand your menstrual cycle, it tells you right on here your most fertile days and the day that you are most likely ovulating. And it takes all those factors into consideration. So if you're not using the pill and you're using abstinence or not birth <coughs> control, or as a mom of teen girls, I think that this is a, an incredible tool to give them, not to necessarily say, here's a new app, this is your birth control. <laughs> but to give them the ability to start to see through their own eyes, their own rhythms within their body. It's huge. In the Taking Charge of Your Fertility book, there is also a software that comes with that and you can track it all and it'll graph it and do the same thing for you too. Um, but what I love about that book is just the, the information and the knowledge it gives you around your menstrual cycle. Um, so the other thing is insomnia. So for women who suffer from chronic insomnia, and this isn't just like, well, I couldn't sleep last night. This is every single night, or at least three nights or more in a week, you're suffering from insomnia. There is an underlying estrogen issue that's here. Estrogen and cortisol would be the ones that we would be looking at. Um, your cortisol levels are supposed to be the highest at night and then drop off. And if you're having any flux of those levels, uh, what will happen is one of two things with insomnia. So either you can get to sleep, no problem, but then you wake, and the wake time is usually sometime between 1 a.m. and 4, 4.30 a.m., and you're not able to get back to sleep. So you get up when you feel like you, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh, well, I must have to go pee. That's why I woke up. Why else would I wake up in the middle of the night? And you get up and you go to the bathroom, and then you come back to bed, and then you lie there. 
And then you start the game with the clock. You're like, okay, I'll sleep now, but I'm going to get X amount of sleep. And then you roll back over. And then two o'clock, and you're like, oh my God, now I'm only going to get this much sleep. Like, oh my God, now, well, what's the point now? Now I'm just going to get up and do something because I'm not going to get any sleep. And it's a vicious, vicious cycle. So those are two totally different types. I would be looking at the estrogen side of things. And, and the incredible thing is when you start to do anything, it's just a two millimeter shift in the different areas of your life. So it's a small shift in what you're using product-wise. It's a small shift in what you're putting in your body food-wise. It's a small shift in your hydration. It's a small shift in your movement. It's a small shift in your mentality, a small shift in the people you surround yourself with. All those little shifts accumulate to be this incredible change that you're gonna feel first and foremost in your level of energy. You're actually gonna be able to, you'll describe yourself differently to people, okay? You, when, you know, if you're that person that when people ask you how you're feeling, it never comes with a positive, right? Like, right, that kind of thing. This will be like, I feel pretty good, I feel good. And then you'll have that moment of recognition where it's like, oh my gosh, I feel pretty good. When did that happen? Right? And it's an awesome moment when that happens. And that's something you have to attach yourself to. As women, we get so attached to what I weigh, what my size is, how many inches did I lose, you know, how thin is this or how big is that. And at the end of the day, that A is not going to be the thing that keeps you motivated, right? If you feel better, everything looks better, right? So you've got to really attach yourself to creating your best vessel in terms of how it feels and how it functions for you. Start to look at your food as fuel instead of a reward or punishment, right? Making your choices consciously, you choose to consume something or you don't choose to consume something. Not, I'm allowed and I'm not allowed. And that's a really hard one as well, too, with ourselves. Um, so uh, urinary tract infections, this is a big one as well. So estrogen dominance and excess yeast in our body are also a big connection. Um, and the reason being is that with estrogen dominance, we just finished talking about insulin resistance. So when our body's level of sugar is on the rise, well, candida and yeast live off of sugar. It is literally their breeding and feeding ground, and so is dampness. So if you've ever um, had acupuncture or listened to any level of Chinese medicine, they talk a lot about the yin and the yang and the cooling foods, the warming foods and damp environments. When you have estrogen dominance and you have insulin resistance and you have yeast and you have urinary tract infections, you have a lot of dampness in your body. It also means it's very acidic. So we have to work at alkalizing your system and, uh, and, and starting to reduce that. So I, I talk a little bit further down here, but one of the most powerful things you can do for your body is take a daily probiotic. Put the good bacteria back in your system. And yes, it's daily, and really from the time your little ones are born until the time that you know, we leave this earth, we should be taking a daily form of probiotics, not in yogurt. Yogurt is dampening and inflammatory and acidic. You don't want to be getting it from that. And you need to have a supplement that has a bare minimum of about 15 billion cultures. So don't go and buy your Jameson or your Costco brand probiotics. You, you might as well flush them down the toilet because that's where they're going. And you're literally paying for expensive pee and poo. Your body's not going to assimilate that and it's not going to do what it needs to do. Um, there's a new one on the market that's been out for about six to eight months now uh, by Genuine Health. And it's only five billion cultures, but it's with your daily recommended amount of fish oil. And what's really awesome about it, two things. The first is that for people who don't like taking a lot of supplements, it's a twofer. So you get your fish oil and your probiotic. The second thing that's so awesome is that the fish oil actually sticks to the gut. So it holds on to the good bacteria longer. So it sticks, it stays, it grows, and then it flourishes. You want the bacteria to stay in there to do its job and hang out for a bit because then it's there for a longer period of time to fend off the bad guys. The bad guys come in all the time. It doesn't necessarily have to be because you're taking an antibiotic or something like that. It's just coming in in general into our bodies. Um, the other thing that you can do, hitting it from both ends, so orally and vaginally, is there is ovules that you can use as well. So if you suffer from recurring uh, UTIs, urinary tract infections, if you have any issues with yeast infections or just irregular discharge from time to time, which can happen in our bodies, uh, Genestra is a great company. Um, you can get them at places like Nature's Emporium and Ambrosia and Whole Foods. They have uh, ovules, so it is like a little, um, looks like a little kind of canister, but it's not, of uh, probiotics. And there is, uh, I think it's 500 million 
that are in that and it's like using a tampon and you insert it up into the vagina and you do it at night and you take your probiotics orally through your mouth but then you also hit it from the bottom up and that helps to kill, literally kill the yeast that is in the vaginal area and help to reduce that level of incidence. So that's a really powerful one too and that is not something that you know people talk about. It's not, that's not something you talk about even with your girlfriend over coffee, right? <laughs> we just talk about those things here. <laughs> but it's important to know that because that's a huge tool. When you have a UTI, don't go and get an antibiotic for it, okay? Consult with a homeopathic practitioner. You can call and do that for free at Nature's Emporium. On Thursdays, they even have a homeopath that's in there for free. We have a homeopath here that you can call and will treat you acutely. They're all over New York. It has a walk-in homeopathic clinic down on Main Street at the Invisible City. It's incredible. Call, they'll take your case. Homeopathic remedies are so unbelievably beautiful because you can never overdose on them. They don't contraindicate with anything else. They are a messenger to your body. They're not a commander. They don't force your body to do something. They merely suggest and guide your body back to bringing its own balance. So that can help to get rid of the discomfort and the pain that you can get with bladder infection sometimes. Um, the other thing is using pure cranberry uh, pills, so not ocean spray, okay? We're not drinking because that's just sugar and it's going to breed more of it. Um, so little tips and things like that. Uh, depression is strongly related to estrogen dominance because again, the higher the level of estrogen, it's like a big bully in your system. It's going to push down anything else. Es excess estrogen in chemical form will also eat up all your serotonin. Well, your serotonin is your feel-good hormone. Right? And, and do you know where you produce the most serotonin in your entire body? In your gut. 70% more serotonin is produced in between your itty bitty hip bones than it is up here. And we think because it's a mood regulator that it happens up here. It doesn't. It sends the message up here. And in the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum and the frontal lobe, you're producing some serotonin as well, but it isn't here. So I've ever listened to incredible women like Louise Hay and Dr. Christian Northrup and Marianne Williamson and Gabby Bernstein and Marie Forleo and Danielle Laporte, and they all taught, and Oprah Winfrey, right? They all talk about learning how to live from your gut, how to breathe into your belly, how to trust your intuition how to listen here first before you listen up here, or at least create the connection between these two points. Smiling in your liver and in your gut and in your you know, spleen and your kidneys and putting some juice back into this area. Right? This is, you think about it, this is where life begins. This is where we all started. So why are we connecting more and coming back here when we want to be more creative, when we want to have, give birth to something new, an idea, a feeling, a sensation, a journey, a venture? It's not going to happen in the outer shell. It's not going to happen up here. you got to own it and believe it and feel it on the inside first, and then it'll just start to happen. Right. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Um, it, how much is there a relationship between the estrogen dominance and intestinal damage due to that gluten? Well, it wouldn't be the estrogen dominance that necessarily be related to celiac disease. The insulin... Um, resistance would be a bigger part of that because that would be, you know, probably contributing to the craving of getting those things in. But how celiac uh, actually happens in the body is the body starts off with food sensitivity to it. So it usually starts off mild and it's something that we can, you know, ignore for a period of time. Bloating, gas, uh, diarrhea after certain things, constipation, headaches, uh, being cranky, cravings for more of that food, just stuff that we think, oh, it's just me, that's what happens. And then, little by little, you know, that little blurb that you had into the belly becomes like chronic where every time you go and have that, it can be absolutely debilitating for people. Um, what happens with celiac uh, disease in the body is you have all these little microvilli, they're like little fingers, and they're like beep, 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 and they're all along the gut and the, the lining of the gut, and they're waiting for all the food that you're taking in and digesting, and they're going to do this, and they're going to draw it in to the body and then like over the surface of the gut and throughout the rest of the body help to send the nutrients throughout. Celiac, what happens is the gluten, which is the protein that's in these products, it actually paralyzes your eli. So they literally fall flat and they no longer are up trying to absorb any of your nutrients. So the food you eat literally washes across the surface of the gut and is out of the body. 
And so for majority of people with celiac, they will end up with uh, what they get told in the beginning is IBS. So they have diarrhea, they, then they'll go through periods where they don't go to the bathroom for a few days and they feel like they're five months pregnant, and then they will go, 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 and then not go again. IBS is really, it's, it's not a true um, disease in itself, it's a benchmark. IBS is what you're told you have when you have a whole bunch of symptoms, but you don't test positive for celiac yet, or Crohn's or colitis or diverticulitis, any of those issues. That's when you get told you have IBS. If you ever get told you have IBS, you need to book yourself a consultation with a holistic nutritionist or a naturopathic doctor and sit down, lay it all out, be as honest as you can be with you know where you come from, where are you at, and, and start to execute a plan because you can 100% heal that. And with the celiac, it's not, you may not necessarily be able to 100% um, heal it, but you're going to learn a new way to eat. And we don't want to be living in a world where we consume now all just gluten-free grains and sugar and air, as I call it, because the majority of gluten-free food is air. There's not a lot of substance to it. We have to actually start to understand how to eat. Uh, you know, sometimes more ethnic foods, like experimenting with our palate more and start to learn how to do more with lentils and legumes and beans and things like that. And under-proteining our bodies. We are so stuck in North America in this whole ideologically, our ideology that we have to have so much protein. You know, like, and, and I agree that we need to have a source of protein with every meal and snack to stabilize your blood sugar, but it's a source. It's not the dominator. And every body is going to be different. So for instance, somebody with polycystic ovarian syndrome, that person, a more healthy, balanced way of possibly a paleo diet would benefit that person only because we're reducing the insulin-causing problem, the sugars. But I wouldn't be having that person consume tons of bacon and lots of beef and, and all of that because then now what we're doing is we're trading one problem for, for another. We're reducing the level of sugar, so in the beginning people will feel great, they'll start to lose weight, you know, they'll, they'll have so much energy and they'll swear by it. And then the second phase is now they're starting to get bloating, they're starting to have joint discomfort, uh, their bum feels like it's on fire when they pass gas, um, because they have so much uric acid and acidity that they are passing um, from the body, because you've got to think like, all of that meat that they are consuming in animal products, it's very hard in the body to digest and break down. So it's always got to be a balance. I would never advocate to anyone, regardless of what your situation is, to ever remove an entire macronutrient. Not to take out you know, all of those foods. You've got to see with your body. Some people are definitely going to do better taking out the majority of the grains and maybe just having some brown rice and having sweet potatoes and then getting lots of fibrous vegetables in instead of the breads and the wraps and the pastas and the rice. And then there's going to be other people who are going to do way better at having more of that stuff balanced with other foods that create complete um, proteins and have lots of fiber and are going to actually orally chelate and bind to the excess estrogen in their body and help to pull it out via the bowels. Yep. So you said not necessarily for the macronutrient, but what about a food group like dairy? Uh, dairy I do believe in getting rid of. Um, I don't, we were never designed as human beings to consume milk from another animal. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was a product. That, that's how dairy started getting into our, our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a time where that was what we were fed because we didn't have another option apparently to get calcium in. And we were gonna get scurvy and have you know brittle bones and you know everyone was going to have osteoporosis and we were gonna break and have no teeth. And um, it's just not the case anymore. We know now after doing study after study that you know when you look at a cow. And you look at the vast size of the cow, the fact that cows have four stomachs, which means that they are producing four times the amount of not only lactose, but there's lactose, whey, casein, albumin, plus the carbs, the fat, and the protein, and the sugars that are coming with the milk, because milk is pretty high in sugar in its natural state as well. Um, our bodies, we have one stomach, right? The role of a mother cow is to actually double the weight of her baby calf within the first 45 to 46 days of life. Our goal as a human mother breastfeeding our little ones is to do that in the first six months of life. So you think of not only just that aspect right there, but the whole hormonal structure of these mother cows. What their body has to produce in order to take on that huge role of growing this baby cow into a huge animal. 
we are then putting that into our bodies and our little people's bodies and wondering why kids are developing faster and why there's issues coming up. Not to mention that dairy is the most mucus forming inflammatory food possible. So if there's any issue of asthma, if there's any issue of recurring bad allergies, sinus, um, sinus issues, recurring headaches, eczema, psoriasis, constipation, any level of mucus and irritation in the body, you can almost 100% come back and trace it to dairy. And I'm not just saying this, if I work with a client where I think this is an issue, within three to four days of taking the dairy out, an unbelievable difference they will have in their system. Absolutely unbelievable. So when we're talking about an estrogen dominant condition, I'm definitely gonna pull the dairy out because I'm not gonna be putting the extra hormones that are coming in from the milk into your body. And so people freak out and go, where are we getting our calcium from? You get more calcium from a cup of kale than you do from a cup of milk. When you flip over cartons, if you were to go into the store and take all of your dairy, okay, and look at then your almond milk and your rice milk and your coconut milk and your hemp milk and your oat milk and flip them over, every single one of them has 30% of your recommended daily amount of calcium. The difference is the non-dairy sources of calcium are easier on your body to assimilate and uptake because there's no inflammatory response. If you were really passionate about and believed that you should have an animal source of dairy in your body, then you would be better off to choose goat or sheep's milk and definitely organic because they're a smaller animal. They don't have four stomachs, they don't have the same makeup. And goat and sheep's milk, if you look at it from um, a physiological perspective, their milk is more closely linked to mother's milk, the milk that we are producing for our children. So it's easier on the body to digest and break down. Some of you may even have experienced that um, if you've gone and had, you know, uh, regular mozzarella or cheddar, and then you go and have goat cheese, you find that you're not bad with the goat cheese, the goat feta, your stomach doesn't bother you too much. But if you go and have the regular cheese, it may irritate you. You might also find the same thing with certain yogurts. So um, people often think that Greek yogurt is goat, and it's not. It's still dairy. But the reason that people have better success with the Greek yogurt sometimes than they do is say an Activia or Dana or a Silhouette or things like that, the, the first reason would be is that the um, level of refined sugars in the majority of those yogurts is quite high. The second thing is the way that they are processed. So if you look at any of those regular commercial yogurts, they'll have a much smaller amount of protein than the Greek yogurt does. And it's because they're just prepared in a different way. Greek yogurt is really prepared in a way that is closer to the way that yogurt is naturally prepared. Um, and so that's why there's maybe 18 to 20 grams of protein in a serving versus maybe 11, 12 to 13 grams in a, in a regular yogurt. And you've got to be careful with your yogurts too because majority of the yogurts on the market now contain Splenda or sucralose and chemical forms of sweeteners. So again, you're adding to the inflammation um, of your system. So uh, yeah, dairy is, uh, dairy is, that is like opening Pandora's box, depending on, on where you're talking. Yep. Have you read the book Fit for Life? Yeah, I have. Yeah, um, years ago. It's a really good book. Yeah. It talks a lot about, um, that's why I read saying you know, like we shouldn't be drinking cow's milk and that kind of stuff yeah. like that. Also, um, having lots of um, fruit in the morning and how to have certain foods combined with others. And yes. Eat them the day yep. and stuff. Food combining so, is, uh, and again, you know, there's uh, every body is different. So for some people doing food combining, how many of you have heard of proper food combining? Okay, so in food combining, um, the typical thing, you can actually, Ali, there's a brightness button that's on um, there if you need to brighten it up at all. There you go. Um, so with, uh, with the food combining, the general rules are this, and this is in the book as well too. So fruit would be eaten by itself on its own, because fruit is you know, in and out of the stomach within about 20 to 30 minutes, give or take, depending on the individual. Um, you don't combine concentrated protein and concentrated starches. So for instance, spaghetti and meatballs or steak and potatoes, worst combination ever when it comes to food combining. And the reason behind that is that one of those foods is going to require an acidic base to be broken down in your system and the other is going to require an alkaline base. And you can't have two things at once in your digestive system. So your body ends up having this internal kind of tug of war that essentially creates a bit of an atomic bomb. Um, and what happens is the food just doesn't end up getting broken down properly. So when you have gas and bloating, 
The reason you get gas and bloating is that there is undigested food particles that are in your body that your body is having trouble breaking down. And what happens is it sits there and it starts to putrefy and ferment. And that putrefication and fermentation, you can hear it sometimes and you can literally feel some of the bubbles sometimes that are in your belly. That is where the gas and the bloating is starting from. So the way to move away from that for a lot of people is to have, say, your protein with lots of veggies, but don't do the starches with it. Or if you're gonna have the starches, do lots, the veggies go with everything. They're like a freebie. And your fats and your oils as well, too, um, can be with those different foods. So again, it's, you know, you could try it and see um, how it feels in your body. And, uh, you know, that's the way for a lot of the stuff is your body will let you know. You can't force it to want to be a certain way. It's like lots of people I know who try to be vegan or vegetarian, and they're miserable, miserable. And sometimes they actually end up being more unhealthy than they were before. And, uh, you know, it, it's a choice at the end of the day. I mean, we're um, primarily vegetarian in our family, but that's just because it works for us, and we feel really good on that. It's not, you know, I don't stand and talk things, you know, preaching that everybody has to eat that way because I'm not in your body. Right? And that's part of the process even working with clients and, and talking to you tonight is that I'm going to give you these nudges, these tips, and these suggestions, but at the end of the day, you have to try and put them into your own life and your body and see how you feel. Do you find that eating in a certain way that your menstrual cycle comes and you don't have any issues? Do you find that you, if you're on thyroid medication, uh, because what can happen with that is that you'll go through periods where you're like, my thyroid's out of whack again, my medication's not working, I, I gotta go back and see, I think my level needs to be increased or it needs to be decreased, something's going on. Well, it may not need that you, or, uh, be that you need to actually change the level, it's that something in your lifestyle needs to change because you're in a position now where your body's not actually being able to utilize and absorb that synthetic form of thyroid um, medication that's coming into your body. So it's not about looking to the medicine for the medicine to do the work. You gotta look on the inside and say, what is out of balance in my system, not the drug? What's out of balance in my system that I need to work on so I can make sure I'm not taking that? If there's estrogen dominance, the estrogen again is going to compete. It's a huge bully. It's just gonna get in there and knock everything around and it's going to absorb and absorb and absorb. And so we've gotta work at stifling that and balancing it out. So how can we do that? Um, we already touched on the insulin resistance and syndrome X, so let's talk about foods that inhibit the bad estrogen. So these are foods you want to be incorporating more often into your daily regime, and what these foods are going to do is they are going to, a term I threw out there tonight, orally chelate. They're going to bind to the bad estrogen in your body, and they're going to help to pull it out via the bowels um, and the, um, the organs in the body that are going to help to filtrate it and to get it out of your system. So those are things like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, um, buckwheat, which is actually not wheat, okay, so there's sometimes confusion with that, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, figs, now I know you're halfway down the list thinking gas, 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 is usually what everyone says when we start to go through these foods, uh, figs, um, flaxseed, now flaxseeds are a really interesting one, because in some estrogen dominant cases, for instance, if I was working with somebody with PCOS, I wouldn't have them use the flaxseed. I would have them use chia seed instead of flax seed because the flax seed are a phytoestrogenic food, meaning that they have estrogenic um, characteristics to them. And while flax seeds in and of themselves are very healthy and they add incredible bulk to the stool and they're great for us on the cellular level and ground flax seed in your bowels actually work like an internal exfoliator and help to scrape any of the excess mucus and plaque that's in the bowels and get it out. But if you're dealing with a pretty severe estrogen dominant condition, PCOS, endometriosis, things like that, switch up to the chia. It's going to help and do the same thing. The chia is actually going to be higher in a lot of the nutrients than the flax is, anyways. Um, do you have a question about yeah. it? Chia should be brown or good? Uh, either or. Yeah, you can do either or. Chia seeds, um, for those of you who haven't <coughs> had them before, they have a great lingering effect uh, where they swell in between your teeth. If they don't, all get swallowed down. So they're the gift that keep on giving. You'll find, you'll find them for a little while after. So it's just more motivation to floss your teeth. <laughs> um, and then green beans, uh, green and chamomile tea. So here's the thing with chamomile tea that's an interesting one. There's a lot of health properties to chamomile tea, but for people who have seasonal allergies to ragweed, you want to avoid chamomile and cantaloupe because they have the same protein antigen as ragweed. 
So you may not get like the you know stuffy nose and the itchy, watery eyes, but it'll manifest in a different way in your system where it'll still contribute to the inflammation. Okay. Um, and then kale, uh, kohlrabi, which is another incredible green, and then squash. So these foods here, and if you have an issue uh, having any of these foods and getting gas, here's the way to prepare them: lightly steam. Okay, you don't boil. You definitely don't microwave. And you probably don't do raw if you find you get really gassy from broccoli and cauliflower along the cruciferous. So gently steam or juice them. Right, that's another way. Broccoli, you'd be amazed tossing broccoli into your smoothie. If you have a really powerful blender, like a Vitamix or a good quality um, blender, you can put a couple of pieces of broccoli in there and you wouldn't need to know it. I don't want anyone else in your family. Um, there's an incredible supplement that we'll touch on a little bit later, but I'll, I'll bring it to the forefront now. Uh, Indole 3 carbonyl I3C. And what this does, it is a, uh, a supplement that is derived from cruciferous vegetables and it goes in and directly attaches itself to this chemical form of estrogen in your body and it pulls it out via the liver. So it uses the liver as an emulsifying and detoxifying organ, which your liver is pretty darn important. It has over 500 daily functions every single day. And so when the liver gets congested, and the liver gets fatty, and the liver gets sluggish, you think of the backed up work that it is meant to be doing every single day that starts to happen in our bodies. Okay? So it's another thing when you're getting your blood work and understanding what it means when your liver enzymes are slightly out of whack. Because I don't know about you, but I know when I've had blood work done at the doctor's office and they, you know, oh, everything's fine. Well, can we elaborate on that? Like, because you're fine and my fine are two totally different things. You know, somebody, when they get their iron levels checked, can go in and say, oh, you know, I think I have really low iron. And, uh, you know, the benchmark will be, you know, 11 to, you know, 240. And the individual will have, like, 15 for their ferritin levels. And the doctor will say, your iron's fine. You're right within the parameters. You're four away from the bottom of the barrel. Your iron level is not fine. And in a situation with iron, and this is important for thyroid too, because you can't iron and thyroid medication, they, they don't go hand in hand. Um, you need to take them apart from each other. But if you're low in iron, it will affect your body's ability to uptake and absorb that thyroid medication. And don't take an iron supplement from your family doctor because it's an insoluble form. And it will constipate the heck out of you and it will just add more toxic load to your liver. So taking a <coughs> iron supplement you want to go and get a liquid one. So Floridex is a great one, and it's great because it has a lot of the other vitamins and minerals that you need, especially vitamin C, to help your body actually absorb the iron. Um, when in day, a doubt, for us around here, going to Nature's Emporium is incredible because they're all qualified, trained staff that are on the floor. So they really know what they're talking about, and they know the products that are in there. Um, you can also take tissue salts for your iron as well, so Ferrum Foss. Uh, is a homeopathic tissue salt and it just dissolves on the tongue. We are made up of minerals, that's what our body has come from, that's what we are made from. So when you can supplement in matching ways, um, your body's going to respond really, really well to that. Um, the, and a the question here, I get asked this all the time, well I have a thyroid condition, I'm told I shouldn't be having a lot of cruciferous uh, foods, and, you know, I'm told I can't have this and that because it'll slow the thyroid down. I have yet to meet anyone that is overdosing on broccoli and cauliflower and all of their greens to the point where, like, you would be have to take in copious amounts on a daily basis for it to have a goiterogenic effect on the thyroid. So if you're having, and when you're eating holistically, you're not eating the same food every single day. So it never really should be an issue. You're not having broccoli seven days a week. You're not having spinach seven days a week. And this is one that people get stuck in the habit of with their smoothies. They find a recipe. And they're like, this one works, so I'm going to stick to it for the next eight years. <laughs> and then you start to develop issues with the sensitivity against the spinach, or against the banana, or against the blueberries, or against the almond milk, because you only ever use almond milk. you got to change it up. Right? On the milk note, start making your own. I have, uh, and I've released a video on it, and you can go back onto our blog, and you can link to the website, or onto genpike.wordpress.com, making cashew milk. And I'm not kidding you, it literally takes two minutes. And so I have cashews soaking in a bowl right now. So I just put two cups of cashews, raw cashews, cost me $5, okay? And it'll make me about two liters worth of milk. 
Um, and I just put some water over top of them when they're sitting there. I'll go home and I'll rinse that. I'll put them in my Vitamix. Um, I do four cups of water to one cup of nuts, so I'll do eight cups of water. I'll put some dates in and some cinnamon and nutmeg for some natural flavor and sweetness, and I will blend it and that's it. And with the cashew, it's so awesome. There's no skin on it, and it's creamy, so you don't even need to strain it. It literally, I take it from the blender and I pour it into a glass container and put it in the fridge and I've just made milk for us. But I'm not exaggerating, it is that easy. And it is so delicious. So it's great if you're craving that something at night, I will sometimes put some in a saucepan and I will heat it up a little bit and then froth it like I'm having a latte and I'll put maybe a bag of like peppermint tea in there um, or I have this uh, truffle mint tea that I'll put in there with it sometimes or even just a touch of honey maybe and the cinnamon and nutmeg and there's that little something that just feels good uh, and it didn't cost you $5 for the drink, it cost you $5 to make the two liters of milk. Right, so and almond milk is just as easy to make at home, and then you're not getting the soy lecithin that some companies use, and the carrageenan, which is not every source of it, but a lot of them now are a carcinogen. So you know, here we go. We had these awesome healthy products, and then every one of their mother, in terms of companies, had to jump on the bandwagon of creating all these products. The same thing with coconut water right now. Um, you know, the President's Choice has the line of coconut water, which is you know it's from. Concentrate. It's not as it's three ninety nine a carton. It's not as great as using the Zico or the Vita Coco um, or the One. And it's okay to use here and there, but that you wouldn't want to be your primary source. It's going to be higher in sugar for you. But the reason we use the coconut water is it's to balance out the body, to hydrate you, to balance your electrolytes. When we add too much sugar. Now we've just you know messed with that that balance there. Don't drink flax milk. There's a new milk on the market, flax milk. Uh, if you have any estrogen issues, don't be drinking the flax milk. And if you look at that, I don't even know what half the ingredients are in that one. When I flip over the box and look at it. Uh, it's not food. You don't need to be having that one. Uh, any, yep? I see in your list the word soy milk. I thought soy milk was healthy. No, it is not. Soy was healthy when it first became the trendy fatty milk on the market about 12 years ago. When I first made the transition, uh, and I was 17, um, when I made the transition away from drinking cow's milk, and uh, my parents were good and supportive with it, I became the soy queen. So everything I had, I had like the Eve's veggie ground round meat, like the soy aroni, uh, the soy milk, like if it was soy, I had it and um, did that for years and then the more I started to learn and as I was on this journey of learning more and more about the hormones, none, uh, or sorry, um, organic fermented soy, which is the soy that, uh, you know, cultures in Asia that have like virtually no rate of cancer and are, you know, very healthy in those um, aspects are consuming, still healthy for you. We are not consuming that type of soy here in North America. We're consuming majority genetically modified soy. It is one of the largest genetically modified crops, one of the top four uh, in the world. Thank you, Monsanto. Um, and so, soy milk, soy anything. You even look at some of the products like the soy cheese and the rice cheese. <clears throat> Excuse me, they've created these products for people who are choosing not to have dairy or have issues breaking it down, and yet they still contain casein, which is one of the top four ingredients that's in dairy. So it's not getting anyone any further along. If you are having soy milk periodically, or tofu, say you, you know, you're going out for Thai food, and you had the pad thai or had the tofu, and you did that like you know once or twice a month, not a big deal. You go and have a latte at Starbucks, and because you don't drink dairy, you get the soy, not a big deal. You don't want to be purchasing cartons of it and having it every single day. That's when it starts to become an issue. And, and I would say even, you know, twice a week is too much when it comes to soy now. Because you just can't really guarantee the source that it's coming from. And, and definitely I wouldn't be doing soy for boys um, because of the estrogenic properties uh, in it as well too. And soy is a high sensitivity. Majority of the people who get food sensitivity testing done, very sensitive to soy and it's because it's so genetically modified. So is it the soybean itself that we have a sensitivity to? I don't think so. I think it's everything that they have concocted and grown and planted the soybean with that we have an issue with. So you know, here's the whole thing. Let's get back to the whole food and let's get rid of the rest of the junk. So does that include like edamames and soy nuts and all? Organic edamame is okay, but again, I wouldn't do it more than a couple of times a week for that, yeah. But, and, and watch too, like soy nuts, you know, like it said peanuts drink soy nuts, I wouldn't do those.
because they're roasted toasted as well. So then they've been heated to a point where any of the goodness that was in them is, is gone now. Right? When you're buying your nuts and your seeds, keep them raw. Don't go roasted, toasted, chip coated, uh, powdered, spiced, any of that. You can do all that stuff on your own for extra flavoring, but just by straight up raw. Um, and you know, we'd be interested to know too that somewhere like buying them in bulk is, is not usually the cheapest when it comes to raw nuts and seeds, unless they have a sale on. Uh, going and buying them already pre-packaged, like at you know your Zares or your Superstore, and even at your Walmart and that, and you know sometimes at Costco. Um, but there's a bit of a debate about the Costco brand nuts now and what they are using on them. Yay! Um, so it's it's less expensive for you to go and buy it pre-packaged, uh, like at Walmart and, and Zares and Superstore, and that than it is to go buy in bulk. Because your nuts and seeds, they will cost you a lot. It's the thing when people when clients come back to me after getting a meal plan, and they're like. I just spent like forty-seven dollars on nuts. <laughs> like, I know, but then it, it gets less because then you just replenish little by little because you won't eat forty-seven dollars worth of nuts in a week. It won't happen. Right? You won't go to the bathroom for a month if you do that. <laughs> um, so uh, high estrogenic foods. So these are the things you want to be avoiding: your soybeans, your tofu, your soy beverages, your soy oil. Uh, flax seeds, we talked about why. Um, I said here use chia seeds and hemp oil or coconut oil in smoothies and in salad dressings and that. Or, um, and coconut oil is great to use for medium to higher heat soft air uh, cooking. All the oil you would use for sauteing. Um, Grapeseed oil is another good one for that. Um, coffee. So here's the thing with coffee. It's not the caffeine that contains the estrogen. It's the actual coffee itself. So if you're consuming a lot of coffee in the day, um, you are increasing the level of chemical forms of estrogen that are going into your body. Using an organic coffee is going to be better than using a regular coffee because then there's not the extra chemicals coming in with it, but the coffee itself. Now, if you're having a cup of coffee a day, I wouldn't sweat it. Um, one thing I would say is how big is your cup, right? Like, there is a difference between a bowl <laughs> and a pause. And a cup. <laughs> so if you actually measure a cup and you put that in, like, is that what you're having, or how big is it? Because most people that I know that drink coffee, it's actually about two to four cups they're drinking a day, where they would say that they only drink about one to one and a half. Perception is everything. So there is also a great product called Dandy Blend that you can buy. Um, which actually tastes uh, really good. Um, you can buy it online through Dupai Naturals, um, uh, and uh, it, you get quite a big bag for about $30, and it'll last you quite a long period of time. There's yerba mate, and there's um, you know, uh, bamboo and different things like that, but the dandy blend is actually made from dandelion, so the other benefit of that too is that you are detoxifying your liver while getting the same, you know, awesome type of flavors and sensations from your coffee um, all at the same time. Now, there's no caffeine in it, so if it's the caffeine you really like, um, you're just going to start to get used to not having that in your system. If you're, like, so dependent where, I'm not kidding you, I will literally get clients that sit in the office and they'll lean across and go, I will do anything, do not touch my coffee. And I'm like, okay. That's exactly where we need to start then. <laughs> because if there's that level of dependency, then what is it that's happening in your body where you've got such a crutch that you feel like you actually can't function without having that in your system? Right then and there, I'm going to go adrenals, I'm going to get them, I'm going to detoxify your liver, I'm going to improve your digestion. You're super acidic if you're taking that much coffee into your body, and I'm going to work at cleansing you from that other things. So, you know, the other side of, of doing all this work is you know, I would be having you do a gentle cleanse. The cleanses I put people on, you're not going on a cleanse where you're, you know, drinking a couple of tinctures in a day and you're going to have like cabbage soup and all that type of stuff. The cleanse I'm going to put you on is we're going to clear the crap. We're going to get the crap out of your kitchen. We're going to get it out of your pantry. You're not going to cook with it anymore. We're actually just going to, I'm going to feed you healthy and that's going to be your cleanse. It's really torturous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it can be hard, especially if you're a mom and you've got a family in that. And, and those are the people we use our, as our crutch. Well, you know, this is fine for me to do, and I'll totally be on board to do this, but so-and-so will need this, and so-and-so will need that. But at the end of the day, you have to be accountable for yourself. 
So if you're doing this for you because you're sitting here and you're not feeling good and you're staring back at yourself in the mirror and going, like, who are you? When, when, when did this happen? If you're the one falling asleep at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and then you're the one lying awake at 2 o'clock in the morning. You have to learn to be self-centered in a really positive way so that you actually have the ability to then be the best version of yourself for everyone else in your life. There is absolutely nothing wrong with taking the time to exercise a couple of times a week. Try to squeeze one workout a week? That's not acceptable. That's not fair to you. That's crap. Could you imagine with your kids if you were watching? Like, I always think to myself, if it was me watching my kids treat their body in the way that I'm doing to me right now, would I tolerate? Would that infuriate me as a parent to watch them do that to themselves? And if my answer is yes, why am I doing that to myself? Like, that's not acceptable for anyone. But we don't have somebody else above us saying, don't do that to yourself. Maybe you have a great tribe and you've got some girlfriends and you have mentors that are saying, look at, like, you need to do this for you. You've got to slow down. But the majority of us, we don't have someone over us, you know, helping and watching. We're it. Like, you're it. So, A, congratulate yourselves massively for sitting here for the last hour and a half and listening, because that's huge. And however overwhelming some of the information might feel, you're absorbing it, you're taking it in, and then you're going to get to hear it again, and you're going to get to read it again, and it's just a journey. You're just going to start to pull it in deeper and deeper and deeper. Jim, um, yeah. Um, how does black tea rate? Um, it's not listed on here. Well, black tea doesn't have the same estrogenic effect, but it is the same in terms of dehydrating to the system and leaching a lot of the minerals from the bones. So the good thing with the, the green tea, the green tea has the caffeine, but the green tea has all the positive antioxidants and polyphenols and anti-cancer properties to it. It just doesn't have the good taste. And, and that's what we also get attached to is like, it's the taste, it's the smell. It's, like I have a girlfriend who just loves coffee and she's like, no, it's, it's like a date and a mug. Like she's like, it's the whole experience. It's like the lead up to it. It's like the foreplay when I'm putting it together and I know how it's gonna taste and what it's gonna be like. And, and she is just so enamored and in love with her coffee experience. That, that's great. I, would, I don't think I could take that away. And that's fine. And so she balances it out by doing lots of other fantastic things. It's not about being perfect. You will drive yourself insane if you try and do everything to a tea. Right? It's not, yep? The question of the green tea, can I add lemon and honey? Perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the best things you can do for yourself is wake up in the morning and put some fresh lemon, like not the concentrated lemon juice, but actual fresh lemon into water. Warm water is good because it helps peristalsis. You could do a little bit of honey or, or maple syrup and even a pinch of cayenne in there. Stimulates your digestive enzymes, gets the liver nice and clean, gets the bowels ready to be moving shortly. And you can do that at any time of the day. Um, the other drink that everyone loves uh, that's highly estrogenic is alcohol. So, you know, if beer is actually the most estrogenic out of all of the drinks. Uh, and it's from the barley and the hops that's in the beer. Um, and it's contributing to the yeast and the sugar as well. Uh, if you are a beer drinker, I really only recommend, the only beer I really recommend to drink is the Mill Street Organic Beer um, that you can get. If you take a look into the actual beer process, or if you can find like a, um, uh, like a, a microbrewery that's doing organic beers and that, and some of the LCBOs you can find that, those are the ones that you would want to be moving towards, but your regular beers like your, you know, Molson Canadian, or even like Corona, it has MSG. Corona has a form of MSG in it. I just found that one out three weeks ago. Crazy. Crazy. And MSG, there's 49 different ingredients that are from the family of MSG. So we think monosodium glutamate is the only form. I'm going to tell you this now. There is no uh, Asian or Oriental restaurant around that is not using MSG. Okay? It is coming in different forms. So when you see the sign that says MSG with it, they're just not using that form, but they're using some form of autolyzed or hydrolyzed. Um, there is so many different ingredients. Carrageenan can be actually categorized as being part of the MSG family as well too. Um, so you've really got to know what to look at. Simple things like people think they're doing such a good thing when they go and buy like Quaker uh, rice cakes and flavored rice cakes and things like that. Every single one of those that has flavoring, it's got a form of MSG in it because that is what actually helps the flavoring to stick to the product. It's the, it's the, the, the <laughs> structure of those MSG, you know, sister ingredients that help the product to hold its flavor. That's what MSG does, a flavor enhancer, but it's a huge neurotoxin. 
Huge. It'll make you feel like you're going through menopause when you're not. You will have hot flashes, you will get headaches, you'll feel upset in your stomach, you have a major joint inflammation, right? So avoiding that, avoiding your aspartame, your splendor, your sucralose, like that stuff you just have to stay away from 100%. There's no parameters that people say, no, I just, I just you know I have my diet coke as a treat. And I'm like, that is not a treat for yourself. That's like you're being your own worst enemy when you're doing that to your body. You've got to find something else that creates that same feeling. You're addicted to it. Those chemicals, because they're neuro and excitotoxins, you literally get addicted to them. Right? Um, so some of the other ones too, uh, commercial meats, so chicken and pork and beef. If there's one animal product to give up other than dairy, it would be your pork. Pork is the most parasitic, um, it is the hardest to digest and break down. It is not the other white meat because it is like chicken, it's the other white meat because it's pale. <laughs> okay? It's not red like beef when you cook it up. That's where it gets that from. You want to get that out. Uh, any of your beef and your meats that you're doing, try and do organic as much as you can. Know your farmers around you, visit the farm, go and talk to them. You can go to farms and actually order like a quarter or half a cow. And you can pick what cuts you want to get, and you can get it ground, and you can get it however it is that you want to have it. So if you know that you know you enjoy meat, and it's something you want to continue to eat, choose the best quality that you can possibly feed yourself and your family. Um, and, and it is pricey, and you'll end up eating less of it than being satisfied more. Um, you know, two sirloins about this thick and about this round in Nature's Emporium will cost you about thirty-six dollars. So it's expensive. Um, but what you'll find is when you put that level of care and accountability into what you're eating, you're going to enjoy it 10 times more. You probably won't even end up eating as much of it. Um, just because you're going to be, uh, you know, much more aware of the cost and be of just the experience and the gift that you're giving yourself by having better quality. Um, okay, so if you flip over and you take a look at how to correct estrogen dominance. So, some of the things that we have already talked about. Now, this first tip for a lot of people feels like an insane amount of water. I used to recommend for people to drink two to three liters of water a day, uh, probably for like the last 10 or 11 years. And in the last year, based on clients that I've been seeing and feedback from individuals, um, we are ridiculously dehydrated as individuals and because of the state of some of the things we're bringing into our body, we have a higher level of toxicity and we need a more high quality fluid in our body to help to get it out. To make sure that everything from the penile gland to the pituitary gland, which is talking to the thyroid, to the thyroid gland, to your adrenals, to the whole intrinsic system of your reproductive hormones, into your bowels, and everything is working in such a beautiful synchronicity, you need to make sure you have enough fluid coming into your body. And that is not, like I said, your juice and all those things is not going to count towards it. If you're juicing and your smoothies, the fluid and the liquid from that will count towards your daily intake. So say you do, uh, this is a, a half liter, but say you do a full liter mason jar of you know, fresh juicing or you do that, um, you know, your smoothie. One trick uh, that I'll share with you, I do this for myself, especially when I'm going long nights with teaching, like Mondays and Thursdays. I start at 4.30 and I don't get home until between 9 and 10. So dinner for me is a smoothie on those nights. And so I make what would typically be a 500 milliliter smoothie. And then I add another three to 500 milliliters of water and, and thin it out with putting in a liter mason jar. And it's just the fluid is helping to fill me up a bit, but it's helping to keep me hydrated. And I'm still getting all the nutritional components that I have jam packed into that smoothie. And by thinning it out to the amount that I put into that evening one, it's probably actually making it easier on my system to get in and I'll just sip at that. I won't chug back the full liter. But that's a way, you know, and sometimes for people mentally, we look at a smaller thing and think that's not enough. I need to eat food with that, like the smoothie's not going to cut it. So if you stretch that by just adding more water into it, that can be something that goes, uh, goes a long way. The only tricky part with the mason jars is that um, your cup holders do not fit them. <laughs> so you need to work at stretching your fingers out so you can hold that while you drive and you need to get the lids that have the straw that go through it. Um, so you can get the lids that there's actually a hole in it and you can fit the straw in it. Um, and don't go and do like your own crafty ones and just drill through because this is, you know, metal. That's not good. That's how we can get some different diseases if we're just, you know, 
jagged lean side for drilling through that. Um, so go and buy the ones that are already pre-done for you. Um, avoid drinking too much with your meals. So again, coming back to your digestion. Save your drinking for in between your meals. Now it's not to say that you know you can't have some fluid near you and take small sips, but digestion starts in your mouth. So your body anticipates the food is coming because it smells it, it sees it, all the enzymes start to be secreted, and now you go and drown it by taking in a huge chug full of water. And now you've just diluted all those enzymes once, then you chew, 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 and eat the food, and then you throw it back again, and now you've diluted it twice as much, and then you chew, 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 and now you throw back the fluid again, and now you just keep diluting, diluting, diluting until now you've got that floating sensation of the food in your stomach. It's not going to digest and break down because it is essentially in a diluted pool of nothingness because all the hydrochloric acid has been diminished, all the enzymes. Now you end up after that meal with bloating, with gas. Thing to understand with your gas too is if it smells like what you just ate, that's undigested proteins in your body as well. That's a big indicator that you should be eating less of that food or you've got to shift something in how you're digesting it as well too. Um, begin juicing your greens. So it can feel very overwhelming to think of how many servings of greens to get in a day. Start juicing them. Literally like three ounces of green juice is the equivalent to having like four cups of a salad. I don't know if you've ever juiced green leaves before. They don't make a lot of juice. Okay? You can buy an entire organic bin of greens or a big bushel of kale and juice it and not a lot comes out. You're not going to, you can feed a family off of a bushel of kale, you cannot feed them off of a juice bushel of kale. Yep. What type of juice would you recommend? I love the Omega 8006. Um, I started off now, an intro juicer, uh, ones like the Jack Lane and the Hamilton Beach, um, those ones are great. My first one was a Jack Lane, I had it for five years. I paid $100 for it through his infomercial. And uh, it was awesome. What started happening at the end is that I was making more and more intense juices and I was doing a lot more, uh, like I was doing root vegetables and I was doing beets in that. And it's a um, centrifugal one. So it was to A, starting to heat my juice up. And my root vegetables, my beets and that were getting jammed. I actually was filming a show one day uh, and I was showing live how to make juice and it got jammed in the juicer while I was on the and I had never done that before. And I was like leaning into the segment going, honestly, you don't need to go and spend a lot on juicers. This, is, this juicer's fantastic. And I was like, Whoa. and I was like, <laughs> and I couldn't get it to finish. So I had to pick it out, chop it into tiny little pieces after I said, and this one, you don't even have to chop it. You just throw it down and shoot, do, do one push. So to work my way out of that one. But uh, you can start off with those. For the average person, you're in the beginning, you'll be all juice happy. If you can juice one to three days a week, you're doing a great thing. And you can juice, um, you know, ideally, obviously, juicing and drinking it right away would be great. Um, but if you can make a juice or do a picture of it, keep it over the course of 24 to 36 hours, green juicing, your endocrine system is going to, like, absolutely love you from the inside out because it's going to reduce inflammation, it's going to decrease your sugar cravings, your insulin is going to regulate itself, blood sugar is going to regulate itself, your energy level is going to be like ping, shot up, digestive fire is going to be incredible, um, your bowels are going to function optimally, your adrenals and your thyroid are going to be living the dream life because everything is gonna be an ebb and flow. So when you're juicing, be careful how much fruit you add. People keep adding lots of fruit because they want it to be sweeter. You're not making juice. Okay? Juice and juicing are two totally different things. Juicing is for therapeutic purposes. It's not for like, you know, making a cocktail or a mocktail. Right? You can do that too, sometimes, but not every single day. So try to get more of it in, and if you're not juicing, do more of the incredible green smoothies. Right? So I was talking to a gentleman today on the phone and he was very proud of himself because he's been doing smoothies. And I said, that's awesome. I said, so what are you putting in your smoothies? And it was like four to five different servings of fruit. And I said, you know what, it's, I'm so happy that you started to do smoothies, but I'm going to teach you some different strategies because you're, that it's a pure sugar surge in your body. And you know, a lot of people I meet, they do tons of fruit and they add in yogurt. And then the yogurt's my protein and then I do juice and I put in tons of fruit. I'm like, you know, I'm glad that you're eating breakfast, but that's not a great way to start the day. It's actually going to increase your, your cravings and, and the, you know, not so awesome things that you're going to desire throughout the rest of the day. What's that like? Is that same power? Low battery, yeah. 
And how many minutes have we left on that? I don't think we did. We're, we're just going to get through this page, and then we're, you guys are going to go to bed. <laughs> Not here at home, but you're going to have a great sleep tonight. You're going to turn the clock away from you, or in fact, just unplug it and move it away. Um, okay, so blood sugar being stable, we've talked about. I want you to limit your grain consumptions. Um, so this is also going to put in a situation where you are going to be consuming more green. So I've given you some different examples about what your serving sizes would be. Increase the protein, but like I said, we're not going protein crazy. We're going to have small amounts of protein throughout the day. Um, we talked about your probiotics. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of these because we've already hit on this. Um, food sources, we talked about giving up your dairy. Uh, different things too, like people don't realize using your feminine products, uh, regular type like Always and Tampax, uh, tampons and pads and that, fully loaded with chemical forms of estrogen and just chemicals in general that they've bleached the cotton with, change over to organic. Uh, because that, you're inserting that up into the vagina and into the uh, you know, cervical opening and up into the, uh, the body there. And that will contribute to uh, issues with estrogen dominance and to fibroids and to not so awesome things going on in that area. It's really fun being a girl sometimes. Um, also, we've talked about stress, so a huge thing here, and not just because I own a yoga studio, but you need to incorporate yoga into your life. You honestly need to. Uh, it is literally the only form of exercise where every single ounce of your being from the inside out is connected to exactly what you're doing on the mat. And there are umpteen different styles and types and lengths of yoga classes. You just have to unroll the mat and show up. That is the hardest pose you'll ever do, is actually just getting your butt there. Once you're there, everything else you do is a bonus. The breath work alone that it's going to teach you is absolutely incredible because in every pose you're reminded to inhale, exhale, where to breathe, how to hold your body. It's like walking into an anatomy class every single time you step on your mat as well. Um, so connecting with an instructor that really speaks to you in a way that you understand. Doing deep belly breathing on your own. Even if you did 10 to 20 full belly breaths a day, it's going to reduce your stress, it's going to reduce the stress in the adrenals, it's going to reduce your blood pressure and your heart rate. Uh, if you can start to meditate, this is like a, a you know a, a, a hard one for a lot of people, myself included. It took me a long time to get to the point where I can do it. On August fifth, there's a free 21 day meditation starting up again with Deepak Chopra and Oprah. Do it. Don't even ask questions. Just do it. You will love it. 16 minutes every day to yourself. You put your little headphones into your phone. You can lie down at night. Do it in your car. It's unbelievable. It requires nothing from you other than you just to be quiet and be still, and to listen to a very soothing voice, and you will feel awesome. So sign up for that if you go on to Deepak Chopra or Oprah Winfrey's website, so you'll see that on there. I can also send you guys the link for it as well. Um, your sleep we talked about as well too. There's different supplements on here um, that I've got written down for you. For those of you that are watching um, from your home, if we do end up running out of, uh, out of battery power, you're going to get all this information in the handouts. So uh, if I disappear all of a sudden, I'll chat with you soon. Um, so we talked about the probiotics is the most important. The second most important, in my opinion, is the I3C, the indole 3 carbonyl that I talked about. There's a really awesome line of supplements by Lorna Vanderhaag. Uh, who wrote a book called Sexy Hormones with Dr. Alvin Petal, who's a practice down in Thornhill. And the product is called Estro Smart Plus, and I love it because it is a combination. So it detoxifies the liver, it orally chelates and binds to the chemical forms of estrogen in your body. Um, it's got the DIM in there, the uh, calcium d glucarate all of the incredible compounds that we want to be getting into our system. I have worked with women on this who have come off the pill and not had menstrual cycle for eight months, and within the first three weeks of taking the supplement, they go right back into a regular cycle. Women who have had horrible cystic acne and androgenic acne that start on the supplement, and uh, their skin it absolutely transforms. Horrible breast tenderness, menstrual cramps, um, bad PMS, they get onto the supplement, everything starts to improve. And when I see that stuff happen, then I know bang on, that's what we were dealing with, was the estrogen dominance um, that is in there. Um, the other thing is calcium and magnesium with vitamin D. You need to supplement, uh, your calcium and magnesium should be a 2 to 1 ratio. With vitamin D helps to uptake all of that. Um, the other thing as well too is that sometimes just taking extra magnesium. 
So this is a great one at night if you are finding that you're having difficulty uh, sleeping or you're getting the muscle cramping and restless leg issues going on. So a couple of the other ones in here, with any supplement that you would be taking, you can self, you know, dose to a certain degree. But if you think that you have a bigger issue that's going on, make the time for yourself. Book an appointment with somebody that's qualified to sit down, hear your story, take your case, do a Nutrisystem profile with you, and then go from there. Um, there are some different questions that I've put down on here that I think would be great to put into a journal for yourself or just write down somewhere to start to think and create about the picture that you want to have for yourself. What really are your goals for your body in terms of how you want to feel? Not for weight loss, not for a certain size, how you actually want to feel in this body, in this life, moving forward. How do you want to get up every day and describe how you feel? What would that look like? What are some of the things that you're sitting here and thinking now that would be the easiest steps to change that you could create? What are three things that you know right now that you could give up or change over to a different product that would be really easy to do? Not everything is going to feel easy. Not everything is going to feel challenging. The things that feel most challenging are not the things you start with. They're the things that you just wait because they will naturally happen. So you start right now with the things that feel the easiest to start to shift towards. Maybe it's drinking an extra liter of water a day. Maybe it's changing up the ingredients in your smoothie. Maybe you're going to go home and recycle or throw out some of your cosmetics and body products and take a look at buying some new stuff of that. Okay? Maybe you're gonna switch to from chemical deodorant to making your own, which is crazy easy, and I have a video on doing that too. Uh, and, a blo and it's ridiculously cheap and uh, life will be good. The only downside is you, you know, get arrowroot powder marks on your underarm sometimes when you sweat. Um, you know, maybe you're gonna start to exercise. Maybe you're gonna start to breathe deeply. Maybe you're gonna register for the August 5th meditation. You're just gonna start to do something. And remember, it's not about doing it all at once. It's about doing something, anything. Something more tomorrow than you did today and just moving it through it like that. Any questions before we, yeah? I just have a question about kefir. Yes. I've been taking that yep. every day of my uh, in the morning, or just in terms of just I wouldn't do it every single day. Okay. Um, okay if you do it a couple of times a week, but I wouldn't do it every single day. A great source of bacterial cultures in it. Um, is it coming from a dairy source? Or are you doing it from goat? Um, are you purchasing it or are you? Yeah, it's it? in the bottle, it's in the like a milk carton. Kind of okay, so then it's uh, is it a flavored one? There's, no, there's a strawberry one, but I have the plain one. And you get the plain one. Yeah. Um, so that's the Liberté one that you're using. Like, uh, yeah, it's like a ferment. It's like a carbonated type of. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it every single day. Okay. Um, so change up the sources that you're getting your good bacteria cultures from. So a couple times a week would be okay, but not every single day. Same thing with bio okay. Uh, BioK I wouldn't use as a source for probiotics, again, because it's dairy-based. So we want to get away the dairy-based and probiotic, it's actually going to affect your ability to absorb the good probiotics that you're trying to put in your system. So don't use any dairy products to get the probiotic. Um, you know, a, a good live human microflora powder or um, vegetarian capsule-based probiotic is going to be your best route to get it into your system. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Yep. How important is this for men? I know we were speaking about women. But yeah, pretty darn big because uh, essentially, the yeah, um, the majority of men have estrogen dominance now as well. And there's some different characteristics. So um, men that are uh, growing guts at an astronomical weight, uh, rate, uh, there is a big gut little butt syndrome is what I call it, where they have uh, tiny bums and big guts. And when their guts are getting really hard, um, and they'll say like, oh, you know, I got a six pack in there, you know, feel it, it's hard. Uh, that is not uh, what we are going for. And when you start to see men that are actually starting to get boobs, um, and you know, not because it's excess body weight so much, but you're starting to see that. 
Uh, also, men go through andropause, which is a male form of uh, menopause, and there is that same type of cyclical shift. You know, men have sex hormones as well, too. No, our, our levels are not the same, but they definitely, every single human being essentially right now is on some a small amount of a birth control pill uh, based on what's in our drinking water because everyone who's on synthetic hormones, uh, whether it's HRT or the birth control pill, is urinating and it's going into our water, and there's no filter that will pull that out. Um, so that's coming into uh, our system too. It's also through the, you know, our shower water, um, all of that, and just the chemical forms of estrogen from our food. It's not affecting them any differently than it's affecting us, only in the sense that because we are more vulnerable and susceptible to it because we have a higher amount of estrogen, our body takes it on more easily and more readily. Um, but most definitely, and for men, it'll affect them in terms of libido, mood, um, their weight, their energy, all of those things. So the whole family can adopt this type of regime and, and lifestyle, aside from you know the supplement stuff, but in terms of how you're about to eat and the things that you're gonna consume and purchase, look at this as being like the most incredible gift you could ever possibly give your family. Because all you're doing is now feeding them an anti-inflammatory, uh, alkalized, whole food-based diet. They're not on a diet. Eating healthy is the diet. Right? So, every, and your kids, I mean, just think of like, for those of you who have daughters, and you know, no matter how old they are, like, what a gift to be able now to start to give some insight and start to get them to, you know, understand and treat their little bodies in a way that as they get older, because we all know it just gets more complicated, or it cannot, if we have a better understanding and, uh, and knowledge for it. So, a couple of steps to take away from this. Uh, number one, the first, is to drink some water when you leave here, is to have a great night's sleep. You're going to get rid of electronic things away from your head and out of your room space tonight. You're going to try and sleep in a room that is dark as possible, in as little clothing as possible, because too much clothing on our body when we sleep increases your internal thermostat, overstimulates the thyroid, overstimulates your adrenals, or your adrenals, you produce more cortisol, that is going to affect your sleep, okay? Um, and then you are going to take your time over the next few days and read this and digest it and sign up for your meditation and you may be going to go and buy taking charge of your fertility. You're going to start to shop in some different aisles and sit down and create a plan. Have a plan before you go grocery shopping. Don't let your hungry stomach and your big eyes be the thing that decides what goes into your cart. I actually know what you need to have on hand for your family. Um, and you're going to, if you haven't already, do the hormone checklist in the Simplicity Project book, or you're gonna go and buy the Hormone Diet book from Natasha Turner, and you are going to start to understand more about your signs and symptoms in your body. That's your goal over the next few months, and that's just starting it, and then you're just gonna see where it takes you. In September, um, the third Thursday of every month starting in September, like I said, we're launching the Simplicity Project book club. So every single week we will meet and we will focus on one chapter at a time and work your way through your entire body. When we get to the chapters about movement, you will be moving your body. When we get to the chapters about meditation and about stress and about all that, you will be doing all of those things. So it will be very interactive. Um, you'll sample some different foods throughout it as well too so that you can understand what different things are uh, that may be, you know, food that's new to you, you've never heard of before, you don't know how to prepare it. Um, depending on the size of the group, sometimes we may do, you know, cooking demos and things like that. So it's, uh, it's awesome and it's exciting and we're going to see where it goes and by the end of it, so by June next year, everyone is going to be these incredible hormone warriors and know exactly what's going on in their body. And then you're just gonna spread that and pay it forward. Everything you learn, you need to tell someone that. This is an information you keep to yourself. You have to be like, oh, I learned all this secret information. And you don't know, <laughs> how are your inflamed ovaries? <laughs> you, you are going to spread this, and even to the naysayers, right? And you're not gonna force, you're just gonna nudge. Or you're gonna like just discreetly leave information out. <laughs> open a magazine to a certain page or a book or whatever it may be. But you're going to start to help the people around you, right? Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. It was Thank awesome. You. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.